if anyone's got any questions if anyone's got any questions then just ask or put something in the chat um, and we'll do our best to answer them Yeah, um, go on, Daryl. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, panel. Um, it's always interesting to learn about hydrological careers. Um, I've got a broad question. Uh, what do you think the future growth areas are going to be for hydrology over the next 10 years? That's a good question. Um, I think uh, I'll try and answer it first. I think there'll definitely be um, an increase in looking at flood warning. I'm not sure how yeah um how we can improve our flood warning systems um especially for like surface water flooding i think there'll be a big growth in that and we've got the ea hydrology roadmap as well um which is being developed i don't know chris if you've got more detail on that that's your area of expertise yeah. i think it, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of our program sort of in six years time when we get to the end of it um i think certainly um Flood hydrology is going to be a growth area, unfortunately, because it, the, the climate change impacts is going to mean we're going to have a lot more flooding. Um, the, I, I wonder whether the, the changing methods that um, are on the horizon might mean we, we need hydrologists with a different skill set maybe to today, um, maybe with more computational expertise, things like machine learning is certainly something which is on the on the radar. So, um, I'm, I'm possibly something with more um, looking more integra integrated. So, cross water resources and flooding, we're, we're looking at methods which which are able to do both. Um, so, we probably need skill sets which are able to do both, um, and interdisciplinary as well. So, how can you know? So fields like socio, socio hydrology, um, I think are going to become even more important in the future as well. Yeah, I agree with Chris that, um, I mean, maybe I'm biased because I teach <laughs> how to code, but I think uh, data sets are increasing in size and complexity with how to handle them. So I think um, a really useful skill for hydrologists is learning how to program. Um, and I think especially working with climate model data and understanding climate projections and the outputs um, and the limitations of different um, model outputs and um, it kind of the uncertainties associated with that and how to incorporate that into our um, hydrology that we do across the span of floods and droughts as well. And, and I'd just pick up on that in terms of that practical application of the modeling and the data sets to be able to make good decisions to manage risks, whether it's a flood risk or a lot of what we're getting involved with is water resources, the water resources challenges, the resilience in the face of climate change for things like public water supply, how, for example, for us, the canal network can be part of the solution. You know, we're a huge consumer of water and user of water, but we can be part of that solution working with other, other sectors um, and having the right hydrologists and the right skills to be able to do that is, is critical. That's great, thank you. Thanks, Daryl. That's a good, good question. Um, so there's one here from Marcus. Um, how easy do you find doing open research or papers in your jobs outside of academia? Is it actively encouraged or do you do it in your own time? Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, um, I, I'll go first. But in, so in Mott MacDonald, um, there is kind of a pot of money that's put aside for trying to uh, innovation and research um, so it is in encouraged within I guess within the company for people to be doing um, so any sort of like research or innovation that they they uh, can come up with and they sometimes get involved in research uh, projects with um, like with universities and things um, and there's also a, we have a a grant for, for funding uh, master's courses as well so we have a little we do have some sort of um opportunities for doing research or papers outside of um the day job so to speak within within um the consultancy so i don't know if chris or adam you've got yeah. anything um 
I've only I've only been in my role in the agency for seven months now, so I'm not uh, really quite sure how well that fits in. Obviously, my my priority on my day job is to deliver the projects as part of the flood hydrology roadmap. That's the, the, that's that's number one, and that takes a lot of time. So I think in terms of actually doing research and papers as part of my job, I think that there's not a great opportunity there. I do still have a, a visiting researcher role at the University of Hull, um, which is kind of an unpaid role, but it allows me to keep my email and access the papers. Um, so in my free time, I do have opportunity to do um, research. Um, whether they're open, I think the question was specifically about open papers. I'm yet to jump that hurdle because when uh, when I was employed by University of Hull, obviously there was there was a pot held by the library for paying for research to be published openly as kind of a independent researcher. I'm not sure who would fund that now. So it, part of part of the issue with open publishing is someone's got to pay for it to be published so unless you use the diamond route and outside of academia I don't know where that money comes from just just one more thing to add from from us from, from the Canal and River Trust perspective a lot of the, the research we do is is is, is fairly niche um, but we have in the past worked with academics and consultants to publish sort of peer-reviewed papers on, on topics of mutual interest to others outside of our, our sector. So we've looked at things like breach risk from canals and, and embankments, where that's been relevant to others who might be looking at flood risk from other kinds of earth structures. So we have we have done a little bit of it, um, but it's it's yeah not, not a mainstream part of our, our work in, in what we do. Thank you. Um... So the next question was, would you recommend postgraduate study for careers in flood modelling? Um, so, I mean, I'll answer for, for myself and uh, I guess my career is I didn't do a postgraduate uh, study. Um, and when I when we're em employing people, I suppose, within Mott McDonald, we is not something that's a, a prerequisite requirement um most people have done a master's course um but not a phd um yeah yeah so i think you learn a lot from a, a master's um course in hydrology and there are lots of excellent courses around the uk obviously i think newcastle is the best one <laughs> and we do lots of um very practical um kind of modeling and um, computational aspects of it, which are, are very heavily used in um, consultancy, I suppose. Um, but there are lots of other really great places as well. Um, uh, Lancaster have a course, Imperial have a course, um, Sheffield do, Bristol do. Um, so lots of options all around the country. And they are listed on the BHS website, I believe, if you want to go and have a look at the, the current um, uh, yeah, courses available. Um, but I think I think the kind of step between, you know, the level of specialism that you get in a master's is probably quite invaluable in um, yeah, transitioning from a, a broader undergraduate degree to a more specialist area. I, I think from the perspective of the environment agency as well is, um, I know there's, there's, there's colleagues who are seeking to work with universities who are providing courses to make sure that the, the skills being taught are the skills that we, that we need as a an industry um, and I think um, Hull recently set up a flood risk masters as well and I know as part of that work we did a lot of that engagement work to make sure that the skills that were going into the course were were skills that were needed so absolutely I think a postgraduate course will will be beneficial and they're often tailored to the skills that you need for a career in hydrology so um, I'd say do your research to find one which has that engagement and then yeah I think it'll it, it'll be positive. Yeah we, we do also offer apprenticeships as well at Mott so that's we've got people starting who are, who are doing a uh, a degree and working along uh, and working 
at the same time. So it's a different approach of getting into, into the career. Um, so the next one's from Monica saying, I'm interested in habitat or ecosystem restoration in aquatic environments. Do you have any tips how to get involved in this field? Do you get involved in any restoration projects? Um, so I'll go first again. So um, we've done a few uh, restoration projects. Um, for a national trust RSPB um, and the Woodland Trust, some sort of river restoration uh, projects, but I think that's not. Yeah, we've done a few a few of them, and we're doing definitely. There's an increase in natural flood management and nature based solution type projects that we're getting involved in, and they're getting. Uh, there's definitely getting more and more momentum with that, um, which I think will just continue to grow. Um, so how to get involved in this field? I don't. I yeah. We I guess we're growing the number of projects that are we're working on um, in terms of get masters courses or um, specific courses for that. I'm not. Um, don't know so much about it. We we do actually. There's some a few people on the company have done a nature based solutions course at Cranfield University, actually supported by what. I'd say putting on my um, my my other research hat. Um, I think if if you're looking at getting into restoration projects and restoration work, you also probably want to look at um, geomorphology and geomorphology skills. Um, in there, I know within the agency, a lot of the restoration projects are done by our geomorphology team. So having hydrology skills and geomorphology skills would be really beneficial um, for those jobs. Adam and Liz, I don't know if you've got anything further to add to that one. Oh, so for, for us, for the canal and river trust, restoration actually means something a little bit different in terms of restoring old canals and waterways that were previously used for navigation and bringing them back into use, possibly for navigation, but other types of recreation and, and water-based activity. And alongside that, we're obviously, we've obviously got the challenge of um, preserving whatever aquatic environment might be there and ideally enhancing it whilst complementing the, the additional uses. So we, we have a lot of partnerships and work with volunteers and canal trusts who, who promote those restorations. Obviously, funding for them uh, is, is, is always difficult. Um, but then working with consultants to achieve the right sort of environmental impact uh, assessment of, of what the restoration might, might end up doing. So hopefully it provides um, ecosystem services as well as this, this wider benefit around well-being um, and sort of uh, the, the longer term sustainability of a, of a restored canal has to be taken into account. Yeah, I suppose it's not really my area that I research and I have been doing some kind of modelling aspects of natural flood management. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely a, a growing area of research as well. Um, Daryl has put in the chat, though, a link to the River Restoration Centre, which runs some courses. So that might be a good um, uh, place to start getting involved in some of these restoration projects. Thanks, Daryl. Um, so then the next question is from Joseph saying, what is the best way you'd recommend a person from maths or physics background get into hydrology? Um, all, I guess all I can say is that we employ people who've got maths degrees and give them jobs doing <laughs> hydrology. <laughs> so, um, we've, yeah, we have definitely a, a few maths um, and they've got, they've then been chartered in um, the, ma the maths. I'm not sure what the chartership is, maths, maths Institute chartership. Um, and um, yeah, I've just got directly involved with um, the projects that we work on. Yeah, maths is a, an incredibly valuable degree. I think all of hydrology is underpinned by maths in some ways. So whether that's kind of um, the hydraulics uh, maths that goes into um, flood modelling or whether it's kind of statistical analysis of data. Um, yeah, there's almost everything in hydrology will involve some level of maths. Some of it you only need a little bit and you can just kind of apply things without having to think about it too much, but having a proper mathematician or statistician on your team is going to increase the um, 
uh, suppose, value of your work and rigor of your work as well. So everyone always wants to hire maths graduates. <laughs> yeah, I'd completely agree, Liz. I mean, and some of the individuals in my team who've come through um, have, have ended up doing further maths training and, and learning to make sure they, they've got the, the correct mathematical skills to be able to underpin the hydrological and the modeling analysis we want to do. So I couldn't agree further. Yeah. Yeah. And going back to an earlier question as well, I think they're already valuable skills, but I think it's increasingly so in the future as um, I think it, particularly with things like machine learning, I think we're, we're yeah. going to need those skills a lot more. I think if you're specifically asking, you know, what kind of job title should I be looking for, then data scientist or uh, modeler might be the ones um, where you're more likely to get an interview based off a, just a maths degree without any hydrology in it. Um, but once you start working in the area, I think hydrology is very applied and you will pick it up quite quickly and yeah, then be able to transfer over. So yeah, probably modeling or data analysis is going to be your route in and then you can move around. Yeah, I'd agree with that. But the maths, um, the, the, I guess the, the applicants we get with maths degrees are looking at computer um, CFD um, modeling and, and detail modeling and then they, then they just get involved with, yeah, all the elements of the projects and learn on the job. Good, definitely a great skill to have. Um, and then we've got a question here. Outside of oh, sorry, it's all jumping around. Uh, outside of just the degrees, are there networking, volunteering, or other things you'd recommend to get involved in, or just give yourself a leg up in the field? Become a member of BHS, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Go in member of BHS go along to all the uh, talks and things and get involved uh, would be great yeah um, and, and, and I then... think I'd, I'd add uh, just to come in there Emily I'd add that um, my role on the BHS National Committee is actually as the the SIWEM Water Resources Panel representative so the Chartered Institute of Water and Environmental Management is a, is a very broad church um, and, and it does afford a chartered status which which unfortunately we can't give chartered hydrologists at the moment in the UK um, so the SIWEM route is something which which I strongly support. It gives you that very broad understanding of, of the, the whole water and environmental field and gives you great opportunities to, to network and to build contacts um, and to build build those those uh, professional relationships outside of your normal sort of day-to-day -day job. Um, and they can be invaluable at various stages in your career, um, just in terms of references or support and that recognition of the level that you're working at outside of your, your immediate peers is really important, I think, as you, as you develop. Yeah, I completely agree with that, Adam. Um, yeah, we strongly encourage people to get chartered and um, having that, um, if someone's already you know, coming along for an interview and they're already uh, getting involved, then that's a, a great thing to be doing. And I think for me, um, just if you just showing that you have um, passion about the subject area. So if you um, any kind of local volunteering aspects to do with um with flooding flood risk hydrology river restoration anything like that then just shows that you, you you're keen and passionate about what you do and you care and that that's very important yeah i think another thing you could look out for is um paid internships as well i know uh, we we do do a few of those through the agency where um we bring people on for a few weeks or up to a year and I think that can give you a really good insight into, uh, you know, how things happen. But also, it's a really great way of making, um, of creating those networks and getting to know people and allowing people to get to know you and what you can do. As well. Yeah, I think some good ways to stay um, or to uh, kind of learn about the latest research that's happening in hydrology as well. Um, are like there's lots of people are putting their webinars on YouTube now. So BHS has a channel with all our webinars on, and um, the kind of the UKRI funding councils who fund all of the research have um, channels with webinars on as well. So there's the Climate Resilience Program, which has a lot of really interesting webinars, um, and uh, the digital constructing a digital environment network that has um, a good seminar series as well. And then you can see in uh, Chris's, Chris's name, he's got his Twitter handle there as well. So like Twitter's actually, you can generate your own little um, 
specialist news feed of hydrology news. So probably go to follow Chris on Twitter and then follow who he's following and you'll um, come into direct contact with lots of the hydrologists that there are in uh, the UK. Yeah, it, it, if, you, if you follow me, do, do prepare yourself for <laughs> a bit of nonsense. Um, but then, uh, yeah, Twitter, I, I almost exclusively do my networking through Twitter. It, it, it works really well for me. And I, I use um, TweetDeck. So I have a column on TweetDeck, which is just pulling out any use of the word hydrology. And it just allows me to really quickly, you know, stay on top of what's going on. And when people post papers and, and things like that. Good. Um, so which programming language would you say is most useful for hydrology in a consulting or, oh, sorry, it's just something academia environment, which would you recommend learning first Python versus R versus others? Um, we definitely use Python a lot and R a little bit and not so much others. <laughs> yeah. So R is a really um, powerful programming language for doing statistics in. So if you're solely focused in statistics, then R is the one for you. Python is very versatile. It's probably um, very, it's very easy to learn. There's so many resources for learning it, like um, <coughs> Code Academy um, and other uh, online, um, online courses. So there's just loads of material out there. I think Python's a, a good universal one with lots and lots of support and is used in conjunction with lots of other software as well, um, like um, GIS software. Um, and it's also the main language for doing kind of machine learning too. So um, yeah, they're both good and they're both similar-ish. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I would recommend Python as a first dip into it. And then as you specialize, maybe you want to pick up a different language. My PhD supervisor, when I was learning to code, said to me that you learn how to program and to code first and then you learn the languages. So if you, if you can code, you can learn the language. So um, I would say it, it, it doesn't really matter which one, but both Python and R are, are good bets for hydrology. Thank you. Right, um, so the question here, does any of the water organizations in the UK look at watershed based planning? I've been looking at opportunities integrating planning and hydrology, any suggestions? Um, so I, I, I mean, I'm working on a project at the minute that's um, integrated water management planning, uh, looking at, um, yeah, catchments and uh, future planning where where we're going to. So the Cambridge Oxford Arc, uh, where the water's going to come from, and all the flood risk, and uh, looking at all the different. Um, multiple benefits that could be derived from a high level kind of strategic planning in that respect. Um, so that's, that's being run, that's a project for the Environment Agency that's being, uh, that's, in, that's also got contributions from water organisations. So kind of multi, multidisciplinary. Um, I don't know if that's really answering the question. I suppose I'd, I'd just yeah. pick up on that. I think there's there's a lot of work being led by the agency in, in a lot of different areas around obviously river basin management plans. There's the next cycle of the river basin management plans just started the consultation now along with the flood risk management plans. That's looking quite holistically at a broad scale and that's drilling down to the catchment based approach that the agency are, are adopting, really trying to bring together all the different stakeholders in catchments. Um, you've got for the water companies um, particularly, but not exclusively, the EA recently launched last year a national framework for water resources planning, and that's looking at quite broad scale. It's a, a regional scale of water resource planning across not just public water supply, but also the other needs in the sector, whether it's agriculture, power, industry, navigation, all, all the different potentially conflicting uses of water um, and demands for water at, at a broad scale. So there's, there's loads going on in that whole arena at the moment. Does that help answer the question? Uh, yeah, yeah, you said that's great, thank you. Um, so next question, I have to get a placement in consultancy environment as part of my university course. What do you think is the willingness in the industry to provide opportunities? Um, I know that we have interns within MOTS. Um, 
and I imagine, oh, I yeah, I can't speak for the consultancies, but um, there will be, I imagine, people that are interested in having um, placements or interns, but the opportunities will be uh, quite competitive, I think. Yeah, we've, we've although we're not a consultancy, I think we've, we've provided a range of different opportunities from uh, sort of summer dissertation projects for uh, for MSCs right through to the one year placements as part of a sandwich course for uh, for university uh, students and some of those have come on to to actually then get full time employment and work in the team um, now so it's, it's a great opportunity like I say they are competitive um, there's not huge amounts of funding available for them um, but for the right candidates they can gain loads of experiences we tend to try and ensure it's mutually beneficial the candidate needs to get something from it for their own studies for their own academic pursuit. Um, to satisfy their, their supervisor um, and their course but also we we as the ultimately as the, the employer or the sponsor want to make sure we're getting something relevant out of that piece of research but you usually we've done really well over the years with that yeah so i think it's a case of just trying to get in touch with with um different consultancies or um businesses and seeing what what's available but there will be opportunities out there Great. um I don't know if anyone, there's no more questions in the chat. Has anyone got anything else they want to ask? Um, and if you think of questions after this session, then feel free to get in touch uh, with any of us. Um, I don't know if you, yeah, see our contact details. Is it worth sharing those? Yeah, I'm happy to share mine. Yeah, yeah that's fine. We we'll just put them in the chat. Um, there we go. Um, yeah, so yeah, is there any more questions from anyone? If not, then um, hang on. For those of us already working in the field of hydrology, how would we go about pursuing research opportunities outside of work? Is it a matter of emailing researchers at universities? I'll leave those to answer that. Yeah, so um, I suppose uh, researchers are always looking for opportunities to make links to um, uh, industry, especially there's a big push for research to have real world impact. So um, yeah, we're always really interested in hearing from people about um, your research needs and um, yeah, getting, I mean, there's lots of different kind of scales of funding available as well so we can do everything from um a you know having a master student spend a few months doing some research um uh, on a topic which doesn't really involve any uh, kind of funding available because the master students are already there and they're often really interested in working with an industrial partner um through to uh, kind of being a partner on a phd project so that will be um a very detailed uh, and deep dive into something over several years um, all the way through to being kind of partners on actual um, grant bids as well, where you would write letters of support and um, give kind of an in-kind contribution uh, as kind of your time as someone in industry who's contributing to the project that then a research council would fund. So um, if that's something that you're interested in doing, then finding the right academic is uh, probably uh, going to be the hardest, hardest part of that. Um, but if you go to, you know, if you watch some of these webinars and um, kind of get involved in the DHS community, um, then you'll get a feel for who is working in which areas and, um, uh, yeah, and then just kind of networking and getting in touch with people is, is a good idea, I think. Yeah, I think, I think that's right, just getting in touch with people. It's sort of looking at your question, Duncan, about um, pursuing research opportunities. I think if you've got a, a research idea, um, I think it's always worth approaching an academic um, if you wish to work with them on that. I think that, that usually would be more than happy to, to help you discuss it and work on it. But I think with research opportunities, I think it, it um, potentially it's a bit more, a bit more difficult if, um, 
if they're kind of unpaid kind of roles. I don't know what you're thinking really with those. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully that answers the question up here. So I'm a STEM undergrad. I have some environmental science modules done. If I finish my degree with geology, will I be maths poor for geohydrogeology at MSc level? I'm a geologist. I did uh, my I did natural sciences, but I specialised in geology at the end. So um, a geology degree is good. Um, we get people from a real wide variety of backgrounds. So there are some very maths heavy parts, but that's not, I mean, hydrology is such a broad topic that you can kind of steer away from those if that's not what you're interested in so much. And sometimes it's just using the tools that um, uh, are kind of available in industry. So it's obviously better to understand the maths that is going on behind the modeling tools. So especially groundwater models and things like that, you know, are all built on complicated maths, but to, actually run it all you have to do is hit go so you know it's it's not necessarily um that you will struggle so I think um we get lots of geologists who come and do hydrogeology um and that's like that geological understanding is really vital as well so it's not that maths is superior to everything it's just that it is a part of it and having proper geological understanding is really helpful for and um, doing good hydrogeology too yeah, I think many, um, so if you're running a master's course, you want to be able to recruit from a bigger pool of candidates as possible. So usually they're designed for a range of skills. So if you have math skills, you can you can kind of further develop them if you're, if you're math, but I think that they're designed to accept a whole range of, of skill sets within them. So it's definitely worth going for. Okay, Stuart's put, okay, so I won't need fluid dynamics, thanks. Mm -hmm. Do you money yeah. to learn it? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Ah merde, j'aurais dû putain. Sorry, is that someone asking a question? No. Okay. Great. Um, so there's no more questions in the chat then. Um, but yeah, do feel free to get in touch with any of us if you've got more questions you want to ask. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. It's been it's really great to see so many people interested in getting a career in hydrology so do do get one and uh, yeah that's great so thanks very much everyone thanks everybody yeah thanks everybody. bye thank you thank you